lunch. Dear thunder without lightning, dear window sound of last year, dear mountainous landscape unfolding, water in air unraveling, dear ice-filled clamor that fetches, I'm fetching, tolling, a libelous suit sold and soldiering up the slopes navigating the trails without adequate supplies, opening up the roof of the ride. A somnambulist, a compassless climber, a lunchless hack, naked on the rock road, my ear cocked to the distance. Dear solo slipping sun, this is the part the slow whispering interrupts. Dear disappeared, dear desperate, this is the part you're always interrupting the part you want to be buried under. Um, but the speaker in this poem may be um, considered to be Prometheus, who the punishment for giving men um, and women fire was to be bound to the mountain and to be devoured every night by this giant eagle. So here's Frozen. Uh, and he, and by the way, he, Prometheus was eventually rescued by uh, um, Hercules came to rescue him. So this poem takes place right before he, before Hercules comes. My poems are all very short. For this, I apologize. The explanations are very long. The poems are very short. <laughs> Frozen. Daily I wish stitched here to live, facing west, watching the last light. Tattooed on my left wrist, let go. Tattooed on my right wrist, not it. Daily, you make me dizzy with messages. And nightly, I am torn open by brood sky and eagle claw. The strongest man in the world is on his way to release me. But what happens when a frozen man is touched by fire? Upon release, I may disappear. <clears throat> I was in um, I was in Brattleboro, Vermont, and I was at a literary festival there. And one of the venues for the readings was a church. And I haven't been inside. I've been inside some churches in Europe when we I go to the big cathedrals and go inside and see the beautiful spaces. But I had not been inside very many American churches. And I was sitting in the pew, and in front of um, me in the, in the pew, there is a little slot in which there is a um, hymnal to sing along. And that seemed to make sense to me. I understood that. And there was also another little smaller box that was affixed there. And it had they had little cards in there and golf pencils. And the little cards said prayer request cards. And you may be familiar with this, but I had never, as a Muslim, had, has never seen anything like this. And it printed on there, it said, I would like the church to pray for, and then there were three lines. And you could write in there. And then there must have been a box somewhere in the church where you could put this. And then maybe uh, the pastor or somebody would select and say, we're going to pray for this or that. So I really like that idea, because it means that you have some direct access to the divine. And, um, but of course, I didn't know where to put those cards, so I took them with me. But I figured if God is all he is cracked up to be, he should be able to manage uh, reading those cards in my pocket. <laughs> Anyhow, um, here's what I wrote on my prayer request cards. I would like the church to pray for a clear reckoning, the core unearthed, what's best born skyward, searched, who is most easily followed, seared, who is most faithful, beckoned to, queer. I would like the church to pray for my psalm to unsettle the case, my askance umbilical lust to review and refute the evidence, to enter my guilt-edged tongue as final proof of my innocence. I would like the church on the inside of my sin to spell out my breath, to draw a wing. <clears throat> so 
so here is here is the sixth day. So I'm six days into the fast. Late morning. I find myself sleeping more and eating less, even when it is time to eat. Rain is trickling down the gutter outside. The air is a beautiful gray. Why have I always, always loved gray cloudy days and rainy days even better? And not just summer rain either, the big warm drops splashing down. No, I love as well the cold, needling rain of spring and the autumn drizzle so thick that you can't feel it but arrive home thoroughly soaked. The soaking, I think, to be covered, suffused, bathed, owned by something you didn't even know was around you. I love mysteries and unexplainables. The Kaaba, the Black House of God, called the Near Mosque, circumambulated by millions and determining the direction of Muslim prayers. The cube in Mecca at the heart of the Masjid al-Haram is actually empty inside. What does that emptiness mean? When the Prophet was taken on his Mehraj, he was taken first to the far mosque, Al-Aqsa, in Jerusalem, and then into heaven. Myriad events occurred there, but the final one was this. God changed the direction of prayers from the far mosque in Jerusalem to the near mosque in Mecca. What does it mean? That you must worship what is closest to you? But the steed bore him to the far mosque first and then into heaven, yes. So maybe heaven, the physical or metaphorical site where God is supposed to be, is not really the most important point. Well, revel revelation is handy. God whispering in your ears, smoothing out all uncertainty, explaining what was supposed to happen next. But what do you do when you are an ordinary mortal, in doubt, hearing nothing but silence? At any rate, there has always been a lively debate over the real location of the Far Mosque, defined in scripture, not geographically, but solely by that adjective, far. Rumi put his two cents in when he wrote, that mosque Suleiman built was not made of bricks and stone. The farthest mosque is the one inside you. Besides the way that Rumi, a preeminent Sufi teacher and poet, sounds quite like a yogic sage here, it's also interesting that he makes no distinction between the destroyed temple of Solomon mourned by countless Jewish people and the mosque that was built in its place. Because what if every mosque and synagogue were the same place, worshipped in by different communities, with their own litanies and liturgies and scriptures, and at their own appointed times, if only? And why is the Kaaba so important? Because there a black stone fell from the sky? Or because Abraham and Ishmael built it as a house of worship? But why there? What happened there? There in the desert, as her infant son Ishmael was dying, Hagar, the first wife of Abraham, put her son down and ran in the desert to look for water. Looking for water in the desert? What was she thinking? For a moment, her son, dying in her arms, she panicked. I think this is the true definition of faith. In his almost death, Ishmael found life. Where his heels hammered, the ground ish the, the, where his heels hammered the ground, a spring issued forth. He drank. Meanwhile, Hagar, in her panic, had run by him several more times before seeing he had already been saved. Is heaven, or our idea of what that place is, even relevant to spiritual practice? Here is one answer. During the Hajj, when pilgrims commemorate Hagar's search for water, Hagar's search for water, they do not stop when and where the water burst forth. Instead, they run between the two hills, Safa and Marwa, seven times. The number of times Hagar is said to have run before she noticed the spring water, which had been there all along, though underground. The Kaaba is a sacred place because it is the place a person refused to believe the most horrifying possibility that she had been abandoned, that she was alone in the desert without succor, that there was nothing she could do to save her baby. And there, 
the closest object to the near mosque, the sole object, since the mosque itself is empty inside, at the heart of Islam, is the tomb of Hagar, the tomb of a woman, an African woman who heard nothing in her ears but the beating of her own blood and the most illogical of thoughts. The boy is dying. Run. So this was from the first um, round of my fasting year, and I did a second round um, uh, that comes after it, and I'm going to read it one um, piece from that as well. So I read the sixth day from the first year. Here's the sixth day from the second year. Um, and I should say, the first half of this book, the pieces are much more essayistic and discursive. And then in the second half of the book, they're much sparer and more poetic in general. Sixth day. At the beginning of the day, you rise in darkness, not what you're used to, living death to go from sleep to dark bed, in darkness still, no sunlight on the horizon, or even blue twilight. There is no light like the rich thickness of blue before sunrise. If you have not seen it, then you have not seen it. You minister yourself slowly, task by task. From a dream of a life, you make a life. Last night, I went to a meeting of Muslim students and felt uncomfortable. Who was I but a stranger? In the morning, after you've had a last glass of water to seal the fast, the day pulls itself taut from your fingers, is a string stretching away from you into the sunset, a string you could pluck, a string and it is yours. The day is an empty bowl you hold in your hands. Reading the spare verses, touching your body now and again during the day to remind yourself your physical existence is real, your body is alive, Despite the dissipation of your mind into clouds and space, there really is a world. Last afternoon in front of the sink, just the mere task of washing dishes becomes significant dish by dish. I held a big orange salad bowl my mother bought me, along with two small orange bowls, in 1998 when I was offered a job teaching at the local community college. But instead of taking the job, I moved to New York, and I haven't lived at home since. My mother, my love, wanted me to come home. The orange salad bowl set was to tell me this. Growing up, I always knew my mother would fast with me, something the two of us shared in the house. Neither my father nor my sisters fasted in those days. So my mother and I hungered together each year for a month, grew thin together, wondered together. There was a world in which we loved each other that no one else lived in.